Okay. This meeting is being recorded. I will share my screen. I hope that's. Can you see my screen okay? Yep. Right. Yes. I will put this on slide four. Okay. All right. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm Shandon Bhagat, and I'll be uh, talking today with two of our other colleagues here, Macek and, and Carlos, talking about sustainability. Um, just a brief introduction. Um, my, I, I've been at Google for the last 11 years as site reliability manager. Um, you know, the main, main job is to really, our day job is to make sure Google is up and running. And very recently, you know, my longtime friend at Google here, Machek, uh, did a TEDx event about sustainability. And it really got me going about keeping our planet safe and up um, and, and running. And I was really excited with me to be coming along and I thought this would be a really good talk for him to come and share his experience that how he actually arranged that and became a change agent in this space. So you'll, you'll hear a lot about his story and, and how, how he had an impact here at Google. Again, and also with Carlos uh, Beltran from the Navigators badge, uh, he's going to be talking about green hydrogen and again, when we were doing this talk, there were like these two topics and we really joined hands to come and talk about this, the same topic and, and learn more about each other. So this was a really good opportunity for us to connect, but also talk about the same topic here. All right, so with, the, with this today's talk, the key takeaways that for people who have joined us and on the recording is what, like what is the value proposition for sustainability? Like what, what kind of value can you add to your business, to the climate? And we'll talk briefly about that. And then we'll get into a very specific example of, you know, even in a big company like Google, you can still have an impact and, and really hear from Matrick, like how his journey came about uh, at Google trying to make uh, a difference. And then we'll also talk about, uh, from hear from Carlos about green hydrogen and how plug power has been making an impact in the last 25 years and how green hydrogen is really an emerging technology, but also a very good source of uh, going to a sustainable space. So with further ado, um, I will give it to Matic. Uh, <clears throat> hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ma Maciek Vinskowski. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm here to have a quick chat on sustainability. Uh, just, uh, just for, for disclosure, this is not my full time job. Uh, so, you know, if there are uh, any things that I, you know, uh, are in incorrect or, or I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, 100% accurate with certain things, uh, please bear with me. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, as, as, as Trenton mentioned, I'm, I'm, I'm in necessary uh, in engineering. So uh, this is more of my uh, passion, uh, which I started pursuing probably around two years. Well, to be honest, I've been interested in this for a long time, but more actively probably for around two years so uh why sustainability is important um yeah beside the fact that there's no planet b uh we don't have a backup unfortunately uh there there are a lot of other uh reasons why if we all should be thinking about sustainability uh i included those couple of pictures in the upper right corner uh because those like the things that are displayed there around transportation uh, energy generation, agriculture, industry, they're really major contributor, con contributors to climate change. And uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of those industries, like th those industries have a lot of impact on the planet. Uh, and, you know, sustainability is like really broad topic uh, as well. That's, that's another thing that I wanted to mention, uh, placing it there. So like there are companies in different, different areas and the impacts are going to be different for for like you know different different sectors of of, uh, of economy or industry. So, but why why from like the business perspective? Why we should be thinking about this? Because like, climate change has an actual dollar value, uh, you know, attached to it, uh, and it's going to get worse. It's going to accelerate, and there will be strategic and operational impact for businesses. Uh, when you're thinking about strategic, you can think you know um, stranded assets, for example, for operational like maybe. Maybe access to certain, you know, um, 
uh, labor you know uh, uh, markets where you know people will be subject to extreme weather events for example right um, and you know there's there are other things there, there are things around uh, companies brands and people are more likely to choose sustainable companies and products over those that are not uh, also this this often comes as a surprise like your business model may not be as robust and resilient to climate change as you may think. Uh, so sometimes it's it's really really important to to have have a think about that uh, because you may you may get surprised. Um, but on the other hand, there's there's also similar learning, right? There there is definitely market share to be had in new branches of economy, uh, things like you know performance and service economy uh where you're offering services rather than products i think a really good example is uh uh car sharing for example right it's it's uh we're the company those companies are not offering cars they're not selling cars they're, they're sell, selling mobility services they're other companies rico for example is 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 a company that's manufacturing printing products but they actually also are selling like printed pages uh, rather than products, uh, they can sell you a printer as well. But uh, they, they, their main model is to to actually lease printers and 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 the materials. So so the companies basically pay for using those materials. Uh, there are things around uh, circular economy as well and closed loop economy, uh, which which you know are probably more valid for manufacturing industries. Uh, and and there's a concept of cascades within. Uh, uh, circular economies where where waste from one industrial process is uh, an input into like can be input into another industrial process and, and not be waste be actual uh, an actual resource so there are a lot of things to unpack here uh, and i'm really not definitely not gonna uh, uh, go into it all it's just that i just wanted to say like this is a really broad topic uh, and you can look at it from different perspectives next slide please uh Speaking of speaking of uh, opportunities, uh, you may you may you may know that uh, BlackRock is one of the biggest, if not the biggest, uh, asset management uh, like hedge, hedge fund company. Basically, uh, uh, they have like nine point five trillion dollars in assets under management. Uh, and Larry Think, the CEO, has been writing about uh, about this in his um, letters to to investors for for several years now. And he thinks that this is like a historical investment opportunity because there, there's going to be so much change. And as always, change, it creates opportunities, right? So uh, that might be uh, another another thing to, to put it, right? Uh, next slide. So where to start? As I said, it's a very broad topic. I included the uh, United Nations uh, Sustainability Goals, uh, Development Goals in the upper right corner. Uh, it's kind of like a UN's uh, uh, vision of like how can we get to a more sustainable world. And I'm putting it there again to show like how broad of a spectrum it is because very often people say like, oh yeah, sustainability, it's all about carbon, right? It's like, no, not really. There are a lot of aspects to it. Uh, and there's social aspects as well. Uh, could be, you know, access to health services, access to uh, education, um, gender equality, and so on, so on. There are a lot of things. Uh, protecting ecosystems, uh, of course, climate change is, is is playing a role there as well. Uh, there are other frameworks. There's like social progress index. They are mostly geared toward really countries. Uh, but there are some interesting things to unpack there. So if you're really interested in it, uh, both of those provide kind of like a nice, uh, you know, um, nice starting point. Uh, so when you're when you're thinking about sustainability in your own companies, like no no company is created equal. There the companies different industries, different sizes, different uh, stages of their of their sustainability journey, uh, and of course you know there will be different sustainability requirements for, 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 for every company. So there's a bunch of questions you can ask and I'll go maybe a little bit into it later, uh, but they're just like, basically like, like to create a baseline, you know, uh, you can think about like, what are the main challenges for your industry, for your business? You can start thinking about the uh, analysis of the commercial impact of, of climate change, for example, as I mentioned, like uh, operational, strategic. Uh, what are the barriers uh, within your industry and and within your company as well? Uh, you know, what are your like? Who are your allies? Uh, and most of all, like how you can finance change. Uh, businesses obviously run to generate 
some value. Uh, even even nonprofits need to sustain themselves. So obviously, uh, you need to think about solutions that are economically viable. All right. Next slide, please. So uh, I included a, 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 a really nice, like like this graphic from uh, it's actually from Stockholm University. Uh, it's it's displaying uh, it's like a pie chart of planetary boundaries because very often when you're thinking about economy or business, we just have this concept of like infinite growth, uh, and we need to bring ourselves down to earth because we are li living in a finite world. Uh, and some of some of those aspects that that you know uh, we have impact on, like some of, some of the parts of the planet have have been exhausted, or are being exhausted, and are not you know cannot sustain themselves anymore. So like you know when thinking about it again, sustainability broad topic. So just kind of brought it there just for food for thought. But uh, in terms of uh, Google. Um, uh, what I did, like I started looking at IT industry, right? The data, data centers consume uh, around 2% of uh, world energy, actually. Uh, as um, you may think it's not a lot, but Google consumes probably as much energy as, as, as a country of like 10 million people. Uh, so that kind of gives you an idea uh, how much it is. Um, I also looked at sustainable uh, development goals, goals from, from United Nations. And uh, there's one that is relating to sustainable production and consumption. And I would add probably responsible uh, is, is, is probably another thing. Uh, and also, you know, mismanagement of human and social capital. Uh, you, you may have heard about like Foxconn uh, factories uh, in, uh, the, that, that, you know, the, I think it was, I think it was, there were Apple factories that were mistreating, basically mistreating employees and so on and so on. So there are aspects to that as well. And I say like sustainability is a big topic and there are social aspects to it as well. So uh, yeah, I started looking at like what Google has been doing. Uh, we've been very involved with uh, climate change for, for probably the better part of 20 years. Uh, uh, and uh, what I did, I, I produced a rather detailed case study analyzing what we've done so far and what are the gaps and what are the lowest hanging fruits. And by the way, this is only like my personal opinion. This does not represent the stance of Google and sustainability. So just a, just a disclaimer, it's my personal opinion on things. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, Google's been involved, especially with climate action for a very long time. Uh, it's been one of the, like, I think it was the first major company to be carbon neutral. And that was mostly through uh, carbon offsets uh, that we're buying. Uh, it's still ongoing, like we're still buying carbon offsets, but the, the mix of uh, renewable energy uh, that we're using to power our data centers and offices is getting higher and higher. Uh, and and uh, the, the carbon offsets are, are reducing. So um, that's, that's definitely what's happening right now. Um, and we're also purchasing a lot of energy uh, Google's been also matching uh, the energy that was not uh, renewable with renewable energy uh, purchases as well. So there's there's a lot of, that has been happening there. Next slide, please. Uh, and that's not everything. Google actually has a really big plans. By the way, all of this is like available. It's public information. It's in, uh, you can go to sustainability. Uh, uh, I think it's sustainability.google.com or something like that. If you put in sustainability, sustainability Google in the search engine, you'll, you'll find it. So there are a lot of uh, environmental reports and everything else is very, very public information. Uh, so uh, anyway, we want to be completely carbon neutral uh, by 2030, uh, which means like 24 seven renewable energy that is being used through to run data centers and offices, not through carbon offsets. There are other things that we're also doing. Uh, we're buying a lot of energy. There's some sustainability bonds that are being issued. And there's also another thing where uh, Google is trying to go beyond just our business and help customers be more sustainable. Uh, I'll mention two products uh, just briefly in the next slides. Um, one is the Environmental Insights Explorer, which is based on Google Maps and it's got like a lot of environmental insights and they um they relate to something like you know uh root of solar exposure uh you know emissions there are things around heat maps in cities and like tree cover and stuff like that and it's really good a lot of uh local governments are using it for um like urban planning for example uh and it's a free tool next slide please a more down-to-earth example is the eco-friendly routes 
in Google Maps, which give you a more energy efficient route. But it's maybe not the fastest, but nearly as fast and uh, I will use less energy. I think it's available in the US. I don't think it's available in Europe yet. Uh, so anyways, like there's a lot of like, I started digging into this and I was like, oh my God, like there's so much stuff that we're doing already. Like how can I possibly do anything here? And uh, and again, my own idea is not Google's stance on sustainability. Uh, I was thinking about like what things that are close to where I'm working uh, in SRE, for example, or in production, uh, uh, in Google production. So I was thinking about, you know, reduction of operational costs through, uh, uh, application efficiency, and, you know, increasing machine utilization, which you're actually trying to do, optimizing the jobs that don't necessarily have to run. They're like really big jobs that are running over hours. And sometimes they don't need to run specific times. Maybe they can be moved to um, times that there's more renewable energy available. But there's also thing, there are things around uh, generating value. So, I mean, we're obviously buying a lot of renewable energy. Uh, why don't we store it and maybe you know use a little bit of arbitrage? You know the the the, the value of energy uh, changes during the day. Uh, it's you know it's cheaper and more expensive uh, during the day. So that might be it. And we're using a lot, so why not store some and maybe sell? You know for for more expensive uh, you know higher price uh, and still support renewable energy. Uh, and yeah, yeah, like reaching customers through uh, like maybe new infrastructure in poorer countries, uh, and also um, employee engagement was I think one thing that really stood out for me, because we are doing a lot but not necessarily speaking about it as much even internally, uh, and uh, and I was thinking that employee engagement could be something uh, that would be worthwhile, uh, and it's obviously uh, you know also a bonus. When you're trying to hire people, obviously now everyone cares about sustainability so much more, and retention. Uh, so um, definitely, definitely bonus there. One important thing is like it's really important to document your ideas because you may have some like really interesting uh, things in your mind, and if you share it with like you know your stakeholders, your management will not like you may actually get surprised that they might be interested, right? So it's quite important to to uh, to do that. Uh, next slide. So, um, so I thought, okay, employee engagement, like what, what can we do? And I, I stumbled across Countdown. Countdown was um, a, TEDx or a TED organized uh, climate uh, solutions, climate change solutions conference that took place in Glasgow before COP26 climate change conference. Uh, and what they did, they, they allowed people to basically apply for uh, licenses to run independently uh, organized TEDx events called Countdown as well. Uh, and they allowed people to, to use the resources. Um, so there were a lot of talks that were recorded and uh, they were made available. Uh, so what I did is I was like, okay, well, that's interesting. So I can have some like, you know, interesting people talking about different things like uh, carbon mar markets, uh, climate change in general, uh, and um, all other aspects like protecting ecosystems. And then maybe I can weave it in with the uh, internal talks, like a lot of interesting projects that are ongoing in Google. And that's that's how it came to be, right? Um, and uh, and I was just thinking, it's like, yeah, that's that can be like, we can really raise the visibility. Uh, and I was quite surprised with the, uh, uh, with the response. Like there are a lot of people approaching me afterwards. There are a lot of participants. Uh, so it's quite important because like you're gonna get a lot of momentum. So you really need to think of what you want to get out of it at the end of it, right? Because just organizing something uh, like, and then people will forget in a week, it's not ideal, especially because it took me half a year to organize this. Um, so you really think what you want to do with it after the events happened. Um, you know, what are your, you know, what are your goals? Like, what do you want to achieve within the company? Uh, it's really important to get the buy-in from the leadership. I was really happy and lucky uh, to be able to reach out to our chief sustainability officer in Google. And she's just pointed that person said like, okay, I like the idea, work with that person. And, uh, and it was really much easier. Really plan the outline of the event like well ahead of time uh, because it's, uh, it's really hard to collect all the materials. I was recording some talks, internal talks at midnight, two days before the event, which was not fun. So I recommend <laughs> giving people much, uh, much earlier deadlines uh, and try to uh, gather 
the, the, the materials as, as soon as possible. Uh, and plan to engage your audience, uh, you know, panels and conferences, uh, things like that, uh, because people will want to engage. I, I was quite surprised we had quite a lot of engagement from, from folks. I think we had six different topics that were discussed uh, afterwards, after the conference, with a lot of engagement with some action items and so on and so on. So it was, it was really good. Next slide, please. So yeah, uh, as I said, use the momentum, keep pushing uh, the sustainability topic, uh, you know, uh, while people are paying attention and they will pay attention. It's a very trendy topic. Uh, you know, uh, maybe think if there are any projects internally uh, that maybe are like, maybe there are people that are already working on some sort of sustainability, sustainability efforts and they might benefit from, from, from the publicity and support. Uh, you know, what's going to be your follow-up? Uh, are you going to plan more events and so on? Um, maybe there are opportunities for a wider climate action, like maybe beyond your business, right? Maybe there are some services that you can that you can offer that, that will let other people outside of the company be more sustainable. Uh, I think that's, that's really great because like we really need to do whatever we can. Um, there may be some also, like it might be a start if there isn't any, there might be, a, that might be a start of some, you know, grassroots movement within the company. There's a grassroots movement uh, focusing on sustainability in Google that has several thousand people actually. Uh, it's a very active uh, and wide network of, of people who are really interested in, in this and, and they're doing a lot of interesting projects. Uh, so, you know, it could be a start of something, something interesting. Um, next slide, please. Yeah. So yeah. So I mean, you know, we don't have that much time. <laughs> there, the 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 science is out there. Uh, it's really important that we uh, focus not on climate alarmism. I think it has been really uh, approached from a the wrong perspective for a really long time. Uh, I think it's really important to focus on the solutions, right? Uh, uh, and and not on the climate change itself. It's, it's really important that we uh, focus on that from for the sake of, of everyone, but also for the sake of the businesses that we're working at, because that 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 might be uh, you know um, really important for these businesses to survive. So and remember, like sustainability is a really broad topic. Uh, carbon emissions is only a very small part of it. There are things around restoring ecosystems, uh, you know, protecting land uh, and and sea. Uh, there, you know, there, there's social action, education, uh, and so on, so on. So it's just very, very topic. And I think like we need to use all of the tools in the toolkits, that, in the toolkit that we have, uh, because I think we need them all. Uh, it's not only about like electric cars, it's also about hydrogen that we're gonna hear about, uh, you know, and all the other aspects. So uh, very broad topic. And, you know, when you're thinking about it, don't limit yourself. Uh, think about it from a really broad perspective. It's a systemic problem. It really requires systems thinking. Uh, and I think that's all. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Patrick. Um, you know, there are questions in, in the chat and, and we'll get to those questions and, and, and also get into how Google is helping uh, from the value perspective. Uh, I'll give the floor now to Carlos. Um, he, he's, he's here in Bay Area, but you know, he's from Dallas, so. Carlos, you can take it away. Hello, good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Carlos Beltran, I'm the Director of Product Management at Plug Power, and I want to talk about green hydrogen and how we're leading the possibility of decarbonization today. And um, yes, I'm um, visiting the Bay Area right now. If it's a little bit noisy, I'm going to apologize. I'm in the, in the hotel right now, but I'm very excited to do the presentation. So let's get through it. And I'm um, very happy to listen to your questions afterwards. Okay, so we'll move to the next one. A little bit myself, I think that. Um, next slide, please. Is it moving? No. Did you go to the next slide? Yes. I, yes, there you go. Now it is. Okay, so. Yes, as I said, I work for Plug Power. I joined Plug Power a year ago, right? And Plug Power is a global leader in green hydrogen right now. It's a great company with a, over 24 years of innovation, has had a tremendous amount of growth, mostly because we have partnered very well with companies that have sustainability at their core, right? And that companies know that sustainability is not 
just to look good, but it also makes business sense for them, right? That's why we have millions of hours of operation of our equipment, right? We have over 50,000 systems deployed operating on hydrogen. And all this has made us the largest users of liquid hydrogen in the world. Now, I know that you probably, a lot of you are wondering, well, what is this hydrogen, right? Like how do you use it? So let me get to it, right? To show you what is hydrogen, what is green hydrogen, how do you use it? And then why do we say that that possibility is available today, right? For a lot of companies that are focused on the supply chain. Hydrogen is a great source of energy, right? Hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe. So that means that this could create energy independence, right? At multiple different levels that go from micro regions in the world, right? To the whole world. Energy is very, uh, the energy density of hydrogen is very high, right? Just one kilogram of hydrogen, right? That is a very light element can substitute one gallon of diesel in terms of energy, right? And actually this number can be improved with further technological developments. But that means it's very viable to substitute fossil fuels, right? With hydrogen in, uh, as the source of energy. And there's different methods to harness hydrogen. I'm gonna talk to you about electrolysis, but there's multiple different methods to, hydro to harness um, hydrogen to be utilized in the, in the market. Can we go to the next one, please? So as I said, there's different, there's different ways to harness hydrogen, right? And when you hear about hydrogen, you're probably gonna listen about the color of the hydrogen, right? And we can start with the brown hydrogen that is produced from coal through a gasification process, and it has a lot of different emissions, right? Then the next one is gray hydrogen. This is probably the most common one today, the most common way that gas companies obtain hydrogen today is through using natural gas through steam methane reforming, right? And also the byproduct of that process is a lot of different emissions that are done there. Through that same system, rather right, the gray hydrogen, if the company that is producing it puts a carbon capture a process at the end of it, right, that gray hydrogen turns into blue hydrogen, right, which is a hydrogen whose CO2 has been captured, right, but at the end, there's still that generation, you have to manage that capture of carbon emissions at some point. The only true hydrogen that is free from emissions from its conception, right, from its production is green hydrogen. And it's a very simple way to produce hydrogen as well. It creates, it is created through electrolysis, right? So that means that we're putting water through an electric current to split water into oxygen and hydrogen, right? And the source of energy for that um, process is renewable energy, right? It could be either solar, wind, or fun. So in the next slide I have, so just one second, I think there's some feedback coming from one of the user. Uh, so I think I'm hearing that echo. Uh, Johanita? Oh, okay, awesome. I think it's much better now. All right. Good. No, right, so green hydrogen is the only carbon-free hydrogen, right? And it takes advantage of renewable energy, utilizes that energy to split water, right? In oxygen and hydrogen and restore that hydrogen to be used for the applications. Now let's go to the next one, please. How do you use that hydrogen, right? And to use hydrogen, we use fuel cells. A fuel cell can be a substitute to a battery. In the fuel cell, the process is very simple. Hydrogen comes in to the fuel cell. Hydrogen goes through a membrane, right? That removes an electron from the hydrogen particle and that electron goes to power uh, whatever accessory you have connected to it, right? And then that molecule of hydrogen strip of one of its electrons recombines with oxygen and turns into water. So this is a great process, right? Because you have hydrogen that is high energy density, right? You put it through a chemical process to retrieve that energy in the form of electrons. But most importantly, the byproduct is water. And it has a lot of advantages over batteries because 
you need very short refueling times, right? You have high productivity because the vehicles or the system that is using it doesn't have to stop to recharge, right? And you can get long operating ranges because you own hydrogen is very light, so you can store large quantities, right, in the tank of that vehicle. So why is it so attractive? In this slide, I'm showing you something that EHL did as an analysis a few years ago, right? And this is a sweet spot for us in terms of hydrogen utilization in the supply chain today. Companies like DHL or any company that is in, on transportation right, needs to carry out a big payload for a long range, right? And that's why diesel has been so useful for them, right? Because they can travel 500 miles distances with 40,000 pounds payloads, right? And they only need to stop five minutes at a time to refill their tanks. When they compare those to batteries, they find they have big trade-offs, right? That gray curve on the left side, big trade-offs with, with payload and charging time, right? So they want to increase the payload, then their uh, range is reduced, and then they need to have long charging time for that. Fuel cells fill that gap and that need very well, right? Because you can maintain your high payload, maintain your long range distance, and you can keep low charging or refueling times. You know? So for that reason, we see that green hydrogen combined with fuel cells, we can go to the next slide, is the one solution that can solve multiple applications, right, of power in the supply chain world. We can power forklifts and support equipments inside warehouses, right, and that's where we are working today. And we're expanding into commercial fleet vehicles, right, like long haul, um, long haul trucks, right, last mile vans, uh, plus three to eight bands for delivery. And it can also power a stationary power that is traditionally used as a backup with diesel. We can power it for continuous power, right? In mass, in large scale. And ultimately, we also see that fuel cells and hydrogen will power the aerospace world in the future, right? Because of its, the same reasons I just mentioned. High energy density, low weight, long range. Okay, so just to conclude, a couple of, couple of things that I, I want to show you. In green, in plug power, we see a net green hydrogen ecosystem, right, being a reality today. By harnessing green renewables, right, on the left side, we're gonna be able to produce and liquefy hydrogen. We're gonna be able to store it and distribute it, and we're gonna be able to use it throughout all the supply chain, right, from warehousing, long haul transportation to last mile delivery. And then in the next slide, I'm gonna show you why it's a reality today, right? We're not talking about decades from today. We are building five production facilities, large scale production facilities in the US as of now. And by the end of this year, we will have the first one of it operational. The map on the left shows the coverage that we're gonna to give to the US, right? And we're gonna have around 500 tons a day of green hydrogen. And then we're also working as, a, as a, we're speaking to expand that network also in Europe and in other regions of the world, such as Australia, Asia, and uh, Latin America. So green hydrogen is gonna be a reality at the end of this year. Right? It's gonna be expanded continuously for the next three to four years. And we expect to have a big impact in the efforts to be sustainable and decarbonize the supply chain of the world. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Carlos. And you know, uh, we have good questions in in the in the in the chat room. So I'll, I'll start with that, uh, and also a couple of hands up. So I think the first question came from Harpreet. Um, let me let me scroll up. So Magic, about besides being aligned to values of Google, how else does sustainability add value for Google's business? Yeah, someone someone mentioned uh, Google trying to position itself as a uh, the greenest cloud. Um, uh, so I think that's that's one uh, one example. And I'm in cloud. I'm working in cloud, so you know, <laughs> just saying. Uh, yeah, but there there are other things as well. Uh, we actually have an internal resource economy. Actually, someone I think mentioned that uh, the, that 
someone someone read that we're reusing 90% of uh, components uh, in the data centers. That is still happening. Yeah, it's been happening for years. To be honest, like I started in Google as a data center technician. Uh, so I've seen it firsthand. And that was, that was 16, 15 years ago. Uh, and we were doing that then and we're still doing it. So a lot of the components are basically, you know, circling around whatever is broken is basically broken up to part in parts and uh, reused if possible uh, and recycled. Uh, everything's recycled. I think we will like 99 point, point something, uh, you know, uh, omission of, of landfills. So uh, it's definitely life. Uh, there's also research economy in terms of internal resources. This is uh, there, there are some white papers published if that are public if you're interested, but we are we have a resource economy in terms of uh, CPUs and 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 uh, you know the storage in terms of hard drives and stuff like that. So the teams that are running services, they 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 want to do it as cheaply as and as as, as efficiently as possible. So that really drives mm -hmm. the internal efficiency uh, and savings from that perspective. Uh, so yeah. there are definitely tangible uh, business uh, outcomes from this. Yeah, and I think Google do want to lead in the space, and 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 people and industry looks at right. So there's also this this need that we want to be in in the leading space, right? So it also creates a lot of value and talent acquisition. Um, all right, I'll. I think the next one is from Juanita. If I'm spelling that correctly, pronouncing. Um, it's the question about refurbished. 90% of the equipment in their data center, do we still do that? Yes, yes, I'm, uh, I think I mentioned that. Uh, uh, we definitely, we definitely, we've been doing that. There are some, if you're interested, there are some, uh, there are the environmental reports that are published on an annual basis. And it actually has all the details. There are a lot of different things there. There are even uh, like supplier uh, sustainability reports and everything else, uh, you know, so that covers, that covers actually our uh, consumer products as well, um, but but yes, it, it covers hard hardware operations and in data centers and uh, yeah yeah we still have a very high uh, number of uh, percentage of, of of recycled parts. Cool. And if I can do a um, a promotion here, right? Look, Power World's working with data centers, right, to produce stationary energy that will power a full data center based on green hydrogen. That's also yeah. an easy, a very attractive way to improve. So I think the next yeah, one, Len, Len, do you want to ask a question about hydrogen cells? Oh, I think uh, Carlos covered it at the end. So he, he was talking about a timeline of like, when is this going to be a reality? So uh, I asked yes. it and then he went into that topic. So I think. <laughs> And I, lo I love your question, Len, because we get that question a lot of times, right? Is, hey, fuel cells sound amazing, but when are they going to be viable? I I would say we're already viable, right? We have 50,000 fuel cells operating in the U.S. right now. They are powering the warehouses of the largest retail companies of the world. And um, that just means that it's very viable, right? This is not a, a laboratory experiment. But... In terms of moving into mobility, you, we're gonna see you're gonna see a, a lot of those in between this year and 2024 on the road, right? Because it's not only us. There's other companies such as Nikola, such as um, Hyundai, right? Very active on the fuel cell world for mobility, and we welcome them all because the more the merrier, right? The adoption of this technology will be also for for multiple purposes. Yeah, I think I first heard of hydrogen cells like 15 years ago. Um, yes. So you know, it's it's been around for a while, but it hasn't been like widely um, used in use. Yes, yeah. and I can tell you, I, I you saw in my video, right? I like around 18 years ago, I built an electric vehicle, and we looked into fuel cells, and they were big, right? They were these massive pieces of technology that need to be done. Technology has come a, a long way to reduce the size of a fuel cell, right? Make it more efficient, make it more reliable. So I think that what has happened in the last 18 years is amazing in terms of taking this to the next plateau of, of operation. Yeah. I think next is from Harpit, also for hydrogen. Harpit. 
Yes, thank you, Chandan. Uh, so I think the context to my question is, if you see across Western Europe and uh, in US, there's a lot of infrastructure that is available for natural gas, be it pipelines, be it port storage or whatever you can think of. Uh, there are ships which carry liquidified natural gas, etc. So what are the challenges uh, if we want to repurpose these uh, the natural gas infrastructure into hydrogen or green hydrogen to be specific infrastructure? Because I can imagine you have these hydrogen being produced, that's an offshore wind, wind farms, uh, but then it has to be transported all the way inland. So what are the challenges there? Yes, no, no, that's a very good question, right? And I think that you are speaking to one of the biggest challenges of hydrogen today that is available. But at the end of the day, for hydrogen to be successful, it needs to be as available as any other power source, specifically probably gas, right? Uh, in order, to, there's two main challenges that I see to take advantage of natural gas infrastructure. Right? One is the size of the molecule is smaller, right? The hydrogen is smaller than natural gas. So you have a higher risk of, um, of leaks, right? So we, and there's a lot of work to contain those leaks, to create better codes and construction for leaking, to create better materials for leaking, right? Especially if you want to go long, long distances, which that one I know. Not the other one, one that is some concerns, and I, I know companies in Europe are working on this, is hydrogen has a different effect on the pipelines, particularly on, on steel, right? It tends to wear steel faster. So they are working on coatings, right, for those pipelines to address this solution. I would see that in the that will probably take another five years to be really there on the commercial side. But the advancements in that space are really exciting because the moment we can use the natural gas pipelines to deliver hydrogen, right, it's going to be a game changing piece in terms of sustainability for us. For work, particularly in Europe, right, and with what they are facing right now with, with the Russian uh, supply of natural gas, I think that's, that might actually accelerate it even more. Right. Uh, thank you, Carlos, for those insights, because I think you're absolutely right. Till the time we have the last mile delivery of uh, hydrogen, it might be technically feasible, uh, but may not have larger adoption. So thanks for your insights. Yeah. I think the next one is for Jean, if I'm spelling, pronouncing correctly, Jean Bozeman. Uh, uh, yes. Yes, I'm out here. Which one? The heat dissipation one? Yes. Yeah, yeah I was just uh, speaking about uh, cloud infrastructure in general. Um, some of the things that we heard about are super important. Just interested also, I mean, I write about, you know, cloud infrastructure. So um, it's the packaging as well. So not only the fuel cells or the chips involved, but also how they're packaged together and what can be done there in terms of the cooling of the heat that is generated, um, you know, to reduce the overall mm -hmm. heat dissipation, there must be some techniques for cooling, mm -hmm. like um, allowing it to circulate in the facility, dispelling it outside, uh, putting your data center in Sweden, things like that. Huh. Now, I just wondered if you could just talk about the, the infrastructure inside the data center. Um, I don't know how much I can say, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. Well, I knew that <laughs> stuff anyway. <laughs> uh, general, in general. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, not Google specific. I mean, there are, of course, yes, the, as, as you mentioned, the packaging is really important. Uh, there are certain ways that you can, you can deal with, you know, being more efficient. Like our data centers are very efficient, mm -hmm. but there are different techniques and like some of the things are public. So for example, the... Uh, as you said, like we actually have data center in Finland, right? That is actually using seawater uh, wow. for cooling. Uh, yeah. So that's that's you know, uh, and and different sites would be using different uh, you know local mm -hmm. climates and and, and uh, you know resources and uh, mm -hmm. environment in general mm -hmm. to its mm -hmm. advantage, right? So exactly, I think that's 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 really important. Like it, yeah. it really depends where you're going to place sure, it. Sure, sure. And I just want to add one more little bit that's like that uh, in my travels. I I actually wrote about this. Uh, HCL, I believe, is the company. Used to be Volvo. 
uh, HCL IT has water cooling in Gothenburg uh, that's cooled by the river. So just mentioning, mm -hmm. just mentioning many techniques. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Chile, like cooling down the data center is like one of the most energy hungry processes. Ah. When you go and start reading about, you know, how, uh, like, what, what kind of energy is a data center using? It's like, yes, the machines, of course, but the, the infrastructure around them is also really power hungry. So right. you really need to talk about that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah there, there's also. Go ahead, Carlos. If I can share there one and then, and then say there. Hi, Jan. Nice to see you again. Um, there is a company called, there's a, there's a trend also to use evaporative coolers, right? And there are, there's a company in the U.S. that has been very successful with Amazon in that sense, right? Because you don't need a full AC down to 15 Celsius, right? But by using evaporative coolers, they have been able to do effective cooling of uh, data centers. Great. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, I've heard about other ways they're trying to batch load all the jobs and also use some more intelligent techniques about how to cool and based on the load of that. So I think that they're doing a lot in this space and, and people have a lot of ideas. And even the unconferences that happen after the TED Talk, people were actually brainstorming and it just gets people energized to come with all these untapped uh, ideas and solutions there. So, you know, you'll, you'll see a lot of those happening. Um, all right, sorry, I think we can take, uh, sorry, there was uh, Juanita, you want to ask your question? Hi, yes, thanks. Um, so with respect to, to hydrogen fuel cell cells, do you think people will choose uh, hydro hydrogen fuel cell cars over EV? Right now there's a, a big push towards electric vehicles, right? But do you think there's a potential for um, these hydrogen fuel cells to take over before the BEV actually get to mass, critical mass? Um, I don't think we're gonna take over because we see more space in the, again, because of hydrogen distribution, right? That's the key piece. To distribute to private entities, like close to your house, right? It's a bigger effort to, to distribute to warehouses, right? And the supply chain that are more long routes. So I think that we're gonna probably meet somewhere in the middle. And I think I welcome that, right? We don't need, it's not a matter of or, it's a matter of pan. But like we need as many efforts to get there. And um, the one thing that I know that there's a group, right? Of the population that has been very wary about electric vehicles because of range, right? Because of, uh, charging times because of cost. So I think that I do see a feature that hydrogen fuel cells can address that concern better for that specific group of the population. Yeah, right now I think uh, the mention of anxiety, I think once people, oh, oh, yeah, once people start owning EVs, they will realize that the range of anxiety is more of a myth it, for most people, right? Because the range of the current electric vehicle covers, you know, 90% uh, of, of their use. But what I've heard so far in the US in California is that uh, for hydrogen uh, fuel cells, even if the range can theoretically be longer, the fact that you don't have the infrastructure to actually reduces the range. So, so it's interesting to see that you are mainly focused on B2C, I guess, so that you work with warehouses and, and big retailers, right? Yeah, I think that there's exciting developments there, but definitely when you see at the story of Toyota and the Mirai, right? like the main feedback is I cannot find hydrogen. There are companies that are focusing on micro generation of hydrogen, right? It's like they are doing appliances that are the size of a like a large size of uh, AC unit that can generate hydrogen necessary to refill two or three cars uh, every hour. So, wow. so, I mean, there's because again, you need solar, you need water, right? And you put that, that appliance to work. So I think it's good. it will be interesting to keep an eye on there, but definitely the distribution needs to be 
much more accessible, right, to become a mainstream product in private transportation. Interesting. Thank you. You're welcome. And I can share that company with you. When all right, I think we have um, probably some more questions, but live. I think I just wanted to check for time. I know we we had an hour, but do we want to end ten minutes early for the next talk, or what, how much? Yeah. Are you... Um, yeah, I think we're good to give the uh, staff a break, but I think if if we have like another question or two, that's fine. Okay, Harpreet. Oh, well, thank you, thank you, Chanda. I actually have a question for Carlos. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I just want to see, uh, hear your view on, um, I know this is, at least there are a couple of companies that I know of where they say when um, the route of the truck or the vehicle can be pre-planned or when the truck comes back to its base, you know, you can have a hydrogen charging station to take care of the, the charging requirements. Um, now this idea sounds very exciting uh, and there are so many, uh, let's say, use cases of that. So think of uh, 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 the transport uh, companies or the cargo companies, they have a fixed route, they come back to the same point. But somehow, you know, you don't see this picking up in the extent uh, that you would expect that such a simple idea could pick. Any reason why, or what's your view on this idea? Like, and why is it not picking up to the, with the speed it should pick? Uh, very good. That's our vision. We, as I said, we work at the warehouse level, right? With the largest retail companies and of the world. And we're starting to make preparations for that, to turn that infrastructure that is servicing inside the warehouse to service the trucks that come to those warehouses to refill. Um, I think it's, it's, again, is access to hydrogen, right? Today, hydrogen, mostly gray hydrogen, right, is a small portion of a business of the gas companies, right, that create nitrogen, oxygen for clinical purposes, right? So we're shifting that to make it more available through the green hydrogen network. Also, a lot of the of the oil and gas companies, right? They are starting to realize that they have a big play on this, and they are starting to do preparations and make investments. There's an excellent Chevron Shell, right, to create blue hydrogen. So I think that once that is more available, right, it's going to make it easier to, to enable this. But definitely, that's that's our view, right? In, in the B two C world, connecting the specific routes, right, makes total sense. Even if you think that. In the future, you're going to have assets that are completely automated, right? Like self guided vehicles, self guided trucks. Having those assets functioning 24 7 is going to be critical for your business case, right? And then hydrogen is going to take a very important piece on that, on that ecosystem. And um, so I think that you will see more on the ground. Today, we have 160 private stations across the US, and those 160 stations can turn very easily, right? With a very small amount of time and investment to refill uh, supply chain trucks from one point and deliver. Thanks again, Carlos. Again, quite a few insights there. Thanks. I guess uh, I don't see any other questions, but again, this is this is not enough time to cover. This is just such a large topic. And I know many people would be even more subject matter experts here than us. and. You know, we're just trying to be doing our part, right? And for me, I, I really appreciate Magic joining on a very short notice. You know, he's in Italy in a different time zone, uh, being very flexible and, and coming here and, and talking about it. And there's a lot to learn. And I appreciate that. And also for the committee to actually be very uh, comfortable in actually moving the time slot. Was, it was really a challenge to, to get one. But I think, I think at, at the end, it really worked out very well. And and Carlos, you know, I, I mean, we we met and we talked, so it was it was really nice to hear and connect about all these things in the sustainability space. And we are just getting started, but as as I mentioned, the time is to act now, and and the change is coming, whether you like it or not. And every business is adapting. It's just like, what can you do, and when can you start on that, right? 
So, yeah, I mean, are, are any other closing remarks or anything else? I don't know. I mean, Matrick or Arcalos. Yeah. yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. yeah, no, from my side, I think that we're in exciting times, right? Uh, it's not a matter of or, but and, right? We want all solutions on the table to help us have a more sustainable world, right? And we're running out of time. Um, but it also makes sense from the financial side of, of the business, right? So I'll be happy to connect with any of you that have interest in this. Uh, I'm very passionate about this and I think that the next decade or so will be very exciting now, but it's also a very critical period in our lifetime uh, to take action and change the way we are driving our boat, right, or living in this, in this planet. Yeah, I just wanted to also, I just want to thank, thank you for having me. And uh, I'll, I will also be happy to, to connect on LinkedIn. I already saw one invite uh, with anyone who's interested in sustainability. Uh, I'm always happy to meet up and chat or share ideas. Thank you, Chanda and Carlos Magic for joining us. I know Jean is here and she's in one of our lead groups called Impact by Lead. Uh, Jean, wondering if you're willing to speak a little bit about like what what impact lead and lead is trying uh, impact by lead is trying to do and kind of like some of the activities around it just as like you know what can what can people do um maybe it's right. participating in this group right right i'll just keep it very brief because i didn't have anything prepared but uh we did give a talk which i think we recorded and posted uh actually we have three one from us one from ap and one from europe so we have some recordings there what we're trying to do is to talk about how economics and sustainability are related to each other and how we want to increase the overall value of business, let's say, and, and divide it perhaps more equitably. Particularly, we had two examples of the coffee industry and the chocolate industry. Um, there's a book that talks about value sharing that we study. Uh, the book is called Impact by Sir Ronald Cohen and uh, easily found on Amazon and other places. But the idea is that, you know, we're all spinning our wheels, right? A lot on where is the value and who gets to partake of it. And one thing that we're saying is the value could be a bit more equitably shared when the entire industry is based on, let's say, the cocoa workers, uh, you know, bringing the chocolate in or the or the coffee. Those were the two very good examples, but there's a lot more examples. I would recommend to look at the book. I'd recommend to look at the postings. And uh, uh, the, the two key people in the group are Grisha Safarian and uh, Sasha Nishioka. And uh, you can contact them and they'll give you plenty of information about what we're doing and uh, how we're doing it. So we, we would love people to join. We would. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. I think if we learn anything this week, it's just like talk to more people, learn about what they do, you know, see how, um, you know, share ideas and, you know, they could be, we need all the solutions that we can get. So thank you all. We are starting um, our next session very shortly. That's open to the public. It's solidarity with Europe. So uh, please join right. us. There's going to be a different Zoom link here. I'll say one last thing. I also want to thank Elaine. She was very helpful. She to prepare this session and she has been awesome through the whole preparation of me to be so thank you so much Elaine. thank you so much Shana, and Magic thank too. you for coming out i hope you guys will uh come and do this again next year and hopefully before next year too yeah absolutely thank you guys thank you. great talk thank you bye-bye thank you everyone thank you. bye